स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट इटालियन न्यू रियलिज्म टूडे Let me begin with a brief background of Italian cinema. So, in 1905, the first Italian studios were built, owned by two of the largest production companies, Cines and Itala. So, both of these, remember, were film com production companies, both of which made successful costume dramas. Um, you do recall what is a costume drama, right? we are talking about period pieces epics almost uh, in the vein of uh, let's say the 10 uh, commandments of ban her so those were costume dramas hmm? big big budgeted spectacular films uh, some of the famous films of this category were the last day of pompey the fall of troy which was made in 1910 and kabiria uh, which was released in 1914 now let me uh, tell you something about kabiria um kabiria was uh, is a story of a slave girl and for those days it was a mammoth production it took 6 months to shoot the movie in studios Uh, sets were constructed to shoot the movie as well as parts of the movie were were shot on locations um it was also considered extremely innovative for those times because it contained uh, uh, dolly and crane shots some of you will be doing uh, discussions of key concepts in film, cinema so you should know what are dolly shots and crane shots let me write it for those who are watching it online these are the concept that you should be knowing and the film's success remember we are talking about the costume drama so the film success in the us inspired people like d w griffith remember uh, who he was birth of a nation and intolerance so we have already talked about uh, he was one of the great pioneers of uh, film making uh, in the us and along with d w griffith uh, another uh, us producer director who got uh, inspired by uh, the success of cabiria was cecil b demille and you are of course by now familiar with the works of cecil b demille and um, these two hollywood producers were inspired to launch big budget productions and much of the credit goes to cabiria now uh, let me read out uh, an excerpt from pam cooks the cinema book um, where richard dyer talks about kabiria so this is what he says kabiria exemplifies the fusion of epic and spectacle in italian silent cinema it is epic in its large scale rendering of world historical events and what are those events that he is talking about the eruption of mount etna hannibal's challenge to rome scipio's defeat of carthage and archimedes's invention of fire weapons and of individual characters caught up uh, in and made great by them the heroes alert the romans of hannibal's advance and their rescue of the child cabiria from sacrifice to the god moloch is emblematic of roman chivalry and carthaginian savagery the presentation of the two heroes patrician fulvio and brawny macit deploys statuesque postures and ennobling framing opening with shots of them 
singled out as men of destiny on a rocky promontory by the sea. Yet it was the slave Mestiz who was to become the popular hero figure in a series of subsequent films, although in the process shedding his black identity. Cabiria is spectacular in its sensuously overwhelming visual quality. The massive sets have a solidity staggering in comparison with both stage sets and later special effects and computer generated constructions of the ancient world. The scale is emphasized by canted angles that dwarf the humans, pans that indicate expanse and forward tracking shots that draw the viewer in. Design pits, the clean lines, open spaces and white and martial clothes of Rome against the orientalist decadent languor of Carthage, where the screen is crowded with ornate furnishing, sumptuous fabrics and furs, the spectacle of suffering is dwelt on in the whipping of Cabiria's nurse Croessa, Mastis chained to a millstone and above all the go god Moloch, a vast statue with a giant mouth into whose flames children are tossed. In short, Cabiria, in a bland characteristic of Italian cinema, welds together in equal measure antique ideals, stylish design, sensuous pleasures and sensual energies. So, high praise coming from Richard Dyer on Cabiria. And if you uh, pay attention to what I have just said, then you can draw parallels between um, especially Cecil de Mill's cinema and this kind of cinema that Cabiria is all about. So, the First World War and the competition from the US put an end to the large scale production. So, we are talking about evolution of Italian cinema from huge productions, big budget productions after the first world war and stiff competition from the US and Italian cinema and Italian film industry uh, was in uh, a state of transition and it put an end to the large scale productions. However, and it is very ironic, it was the fascist regime under Mussolini that revived Italian cinema. Now, Mussolini 1883 to 1945, unlike Hitler or Stalin, he did not aim at total control over the content or style of the Italian commercial cinema. See, remember Hitler had uh, someone like Goebbels who was his propaganda minister and we have all already talked about a film like um, Triumph of Will, which was nothing less than a propaganda film for Hitler, where Hitler is portrayed in a uh, very flattering light, in very, uh, you know, almost he is deified, but that was not Mussolini at all. He did not aim at total control over the content or style of the Italian cinema. For propaganda reasons, uh, Mussolini preferred documentary films and news, uh, newsreel films produced by LUCE and uh, perhaps you would like to note down the acronym. Uh, it is an acronym and it would, perhaps you would like to note down the full form of this acronym. Lunian Cinematographica Educativa. L U C E. So, this body produced documentary films which Mussolini uh, used for propaganda reasons. The fascist regime viewed Hollywood as its model and saw cinema, and we are talking about the commercial kind of cinema, more as entertainment than as a vehicle for propaganda. 
So, uh, there was uh, a divide. Documentary films were used for propaganda, whereas more commercial kind of cinema was uh, viewed more like uh, means of entertainment, almost like popular Hollywood cinema. Thus, during fascism, the industry remained relatively free to pursue filmmaking without facing interference from the government and this is a key element of Italian cinema. In spite of having a fascist regime, the industry was relatively free to pursue their kind of cinema and there was not much of an interference from the government. Um, another key aspect that you should know about uh, Italian cinema of this period is popularly and very derisively called the cinema of the white telephone. You know, rich people had white telephones in their films and they had a particular kind of mise en scene we have been talking about. So, one uh, aspect of mise en scene uh, for showing lives of the rich um, and the elites in uh, Italian cinema was uh, to show, uh, uh, you know, uh, it is an object, the white telephone. And if it is a white telephone, we have to assume, uh, of course, all the, uh, all the props and uh, all the trappings of a uh, rich man's house would always be there. But a white telephone house, uh, a white telephone necessarily signified that th we are looking at uh, a, a very affluent kind of a family. So, cinema of the white telephone variety. And in the 30s, Italian cinema was dominated by this kind of cinema. These were um, light hearted, flimsy films about the wealthy in Italy. And I can give you several examples of white telephone cinema from Hollywood also. Think of all those films starring Rock Hudson and Doris Day, hmm? Pillow Talk and Rock Hudson and Gina Lolo Brigada come September. So, um, these movies are popularly termed as um, the white telephone kind of cinema. Send Me No Flowers, again starring Rock Hudson and Doris Day. In fact, Doris Day had come to signify this very light hearted, uh, flimsy kind of cinema in Hollywood we are talking about. So, um, however, even during this time in Italy, there were exceptions and uh, there was a movie uh, titled very interestingly, What is Scoundrels Men Are, uh, released in 1932 the, uh, and the distinction, it has the distinction of being the first Italian film to be shot entirely on location. So, this is something that we are going to discuss subsequently that how important having non-professional actors, you know non-trained actors, people who had never acted before and shooting on location and in natural lights and having natural sounds, those were such important aspects of Italian neorealism. And then we also talk about French new wave cinema and the new Hollywood cinema. So, we you know there is a kind of a uh, set pattern. In 1935, the fascist regime founded a major film school, the Centro Sper Experimental di Cinematografica. So, it is a film school and it was uh, founded by the Italian regime, the fascist regime. In 1937, Mussolini inaugurated a film complex, it was called Cinecita. Okay. So, two major breakthrough events happening uh, by way of uh, giving encouragement to films. One was uh, foundation of a film school and another was inauguration of a film complex. And then uh, interestingly, um, Mussolini's son, Vittoria Mussolini, he launched a journal and became uh, an editor for a film journal called Cinema. And this cinema was interested in international films 
and also in uh, understanding theories and techniques behind uh, quality cinema. So, launching of a film journal and later uh, perhaps you may uh, draw parallels between this and Cayur the cinema in France during the French new wave. Um, another key film director of this period was Alessandro Blasetti, who in 1942 made a film called Four Steps in the Cloud, a movie that sort of anticipated the entire neo-realist film movement. And why do we say that? Blasetti used humble characters coming from ordinary backgrounds. So, this is not the white telephone kind of cinema anymore. This is not the costume drama anymore. So, Blessed T cinema, commercial, yes, but still used more humble characters coming from humble background, sort of anticipated uh, the kind of cinema that uh, today we know as uh, the neo realist cinema. Another significant film by Blessed T was uh, 1860 which was a patriotic drama and uh, Blessed T is associated with this kind of cinema. In 1940, Augusto Janina directed a movie called The Siege of Alcazar, which celebrates the defense of the fortress in Toledo during the Spanish Civil War by Franco's fascists. General Franco okay, and defense of the fortress in Toledo during the Spanish Civil War. So, taking a slice of history and making a movie Siege of Alcazar. This movie uh, and uh, this is significant was uh, made in the style of a fictional documentary. This is another key concept that you should know, Fic uh, fictional documentary it is called documentario romanzato, that is a fictional documentary. Now, what are the attributes of a fictional documentary? The fictional documentary style generally meant adding a, a romantic subplot or a love story to the plot majorly centered on uh, heroic adventures, military conquests or war and adding a love story. Okay, so, a blend of um, fiction and also something that really happened, a historical account of uh, a military conquest or uh, you know uh, an adventure that really took place. But fictional documentary, the name suggests what these movies were uh, really all about. So, th this kind of hybrid plot became a typical part of post war neo realist cinema, fictional documentary. The most significant documentaries shot for the Italian armed forces uh, were, one was uh, directed by Francesco the Robertis, it was called Men on the Bottom 1940. So, it was a documentary and it was shot for the Italian armed forces. And uh, the Robertis is important to us, because he uh, mentored Roberto Rossellini. And we are going to look at the relevance, the importance of Roberto Rossellini towards the entire neorealist movement, neorealism in Italy. Um, Leo Longanesi, this is another key name that you should know, you should be familiar with. He was a journalist and a staunch supporter of Mussolini. He gave the motto, Mussolini is always right. Longanesi like Cesare Zavattini after him, he anticipates Cesare Zavattini and they, we are going to see, uh, look in detail. Uh, who Zavatini was 
and who he collab collaborated with. So, uh, Longinesi advocated extremely simple realistic films without elaborate sets, but that was the contribution of Longinesi. So, uh, almost anticipated, he was a precursor to staunch neo realists like um, Zavattini, who was a Marxist intellectual. With the fall of Mussolini and the end of the war, international audiences were suddenly introduced to Italian films through the works of Rossellini, Da Siccia and Visconti. So, these are the names which are um, at the center of Italian neorealist cinema, Rossellini, Da Siccia and Visconti. Italian directors now combine the desire for cinematic realism with social, political or economic themes that would not have worked under the regime. See, you were not supposed to criticize the regime. Mussolini as we know, he did not interfere, he did not want the popular commercial Italian cinema to be a vehicle for his ideas. He did not turn cinema into uh, a kind of propaganda, but still there were certain limitations, there were certain taboos and that was uh, the government should not be criticized, society should not be vehemently criticized, but once the fascist regime came to an end, cinema uh, was free from such constraints and directors started depicting and those social and political and economic themes, which could not be realized during the fascist regime. So, that was one upshot of uh, the fall of the fascist government. So, neo realism generally refers to films of working class life, uh, generally which are set in abysmal uh, poverty. This movement tapped into a particular transition in Italian life and became a vehicle for filmmakers interested in vivid description of history and society. The underlying message in the films is that in a better society, wealth would be more evenly distributed. So, now you get the sense that it is more about the socialist concept of uh, a politics that uh, wealth there should be an equal and uh, equitable distribution of wealth among people in society. Often these films would be based on true incidents and used news reel footage. This is a very common practice uh, at least nowadays to use news reel footage. Uh, think even a movie like Forrest Gump, which is pretty mainstream, but uses news reel footage from uh, 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 the times of uh, the President Ken Kennedy. So, uh, but it all started from during the uh, neo realism uh, period in Italy. So, there were uh, they uh, uh, those movies were shot on actual locations just like the French uh, new waves films and used non professional actors. So, this is something that we have been uh, talking about quite frequently in this course insistence by a certain kind of filmmakers on non professional actors. Now, if you think of classic Hollywood, if you think of uh, uh, high concept films, which uh, uh, which is an area that we will soon be talking about. So, uh, uh, what happens in high concept and uh, classic Hollywood films? Insistence on an emphasis on stars, okay. but uh, 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 the more realistic the, uh, the cinema, the more emphasis on natural acting and use of non professional actors. All these great directors, for example, Bresson, Dreher, and, uh, and the directors from the French New Wave movement, they all insisted on uh, using non professional actors. And our own recent uh, uh, Dogme manifesto from Denmark, they too, that is a part of their manifesto to use non professional actors and also using uh, natural lights, the use of natural lights. Um, uh, sync sound as opposed to dubbed sound. So, all these features were first found 
in the neorealistic cinema from Italy. The plots and the characters were used as vehicle for ideas. Of course, the uh, ideology was so clear, so uh, equal distribution of wealth among people. So, therefore, it was necessary to have uh, characters and a plot uh, as vehicle, you know, as kind of, uh, of vehicle of ideas and also for uh, propaganda of certain kind of ideas. There was an emphasis on soft sounds and avoidance of heavy musical scores. This is something we have been talking about because all these things, heavy musical scores, they tell you what to feel. So, uh, Italian neuralists, filmmakers avoided the use of uh, these devices, especially background music, manipulating emotions. In the late 1940s, neorealism influence spread to Hollywood and actual locations where city as important character uh, came into prominence, long takes to bring about a touch of a verisimilitude in addition to using non-professional actors who added a uh, touch of reality to the films. All these things influenced Hollywood as well. So, uh, uh, think uh, a couple of movies like uh, Jules Desson's Naked City and you will understand that uh, those were the children of Italian neorealism or neorealistic cinema. Films of Satyajit Ray for example, and Akira Kurosawa in Japan and also Avagada directors in Germany, Spain and Eastern Europe they too were influenced by the movement. The first neorealist movie as we know it today is uh, Obsession 1942, directed by Lucino Visconti, who later directed another great movie called The Leopard, star starring Burt Lancaster, it's a wonderful movie. So, Obsession is based on James M. Kent's, the American novelist writer of Pulp Fiction, the author of Mildred Pierce, The Postman Always Rings Twice. So, James M. Keynes, The Postman Always Rings Twice is the source for Visconti's obsession. Major Italian neorealists were Roberto Rossellini. So, Rossellini is often uh, referred to as the father of modern film by the critics of Cagliardo cinema. Along with uh, Renoir, he was the most influential name among the Nouvelle Vague filmmakers. His uh, uh, first three films are The White Ship, uh, Plot Returns and The Man with the Cross. So, these are the films Russell and, uh, made and then he later on became one of the most influential directors of the Italian Neorealism period. Uh, it was Rome, however, it, uh, sorry, however it was Rome, open city. Sita Aperita in 1945, which is regarded as one of the first major works of Italian neorealism, which cemented Rossellini's position as a foremost neorealist. Open City Rome weaves together a variety of stories of Romans during the occupation of Italy by the German forces. Uh, it conforms to all the uh, dictates of the neorealist filmmakers, short on locations, using non-professional actors, using long white takes and uh, working in sing sound using natural lights. Rossellini's next film Pesa contains six vignettes from the liberation of Italy and it is a chronicle of Italy from 1943 to 46. It was uh, followed by Germany year 0, 1947, which is a devastating tale of defeat and solitude. And uh, in one of the scenes, a recording of a Hitler speech echoes over the apocalyptic landscapes. So, it is one of those uh, first movies to use um, the idea of apocalypse. Yes, the end of the world is quite nearby, that is what the movie tells us. Together, uh, Rossellini's films here, Open City Room, Paisa and Germany Year Zero, they provide us with great commentary on the then contemporary social issues at a time of political movements of global importance. Okay. 
So, uh, politics is always foregrounded in the works of Italian neorealists. It is more about content. Rosalini famously said, I am not a pessimist to perceive evil where it exists is, in my opinion, a form of optimism. So, you uh, generally Italian neorealists and fi filmmakers like Rosalini were accused of being very pessimistic. You know, they did not make a skeptist kind of cinema, but that is not the case according to Rosalini. And he said, in my opinion, to point out evil is a form of optimism. So, after his fate of neorealist films, he made several films with Ingrid Bergman and made several documentaries on and about Italy during uh, this phase. So, uh, he was also married to it, Ingrid Bergman for quite a while. Another important director of uh, neorealist Italy, Italian period is uh, Vittoria De Sica, who grew up in a lower middle class district of Naples and later on joined the stage. He began his career as a leading man in light hearted romantic films, but soon took to direction. Uh, the other day we were talking about Max Ophels's uh, The Earring of Madame Da, and uh, I was telling you that Vittoria Da Sica played um, the role of uh, Madame Da's admirer. Okay, so, he, he began his career as a, a romantic actor. Uh, later on, uh, his directorial ventures included a string of films, which reflected his social commitment, thereby challenging the escapist fare of Italian cinema in the fascist era. So, along with Rosalini, the Sica was one of the most prominent voices against the fascist era. The Sica's uh, Shushine in 1947 was scripted by uh, Cesare Zavettini, he was also the writer of uh, Bicycle Thieves, and Shushine is an account of the Shushine boys of the post war Italy and was shot on real locations using non professional actors. Our own Hindi movie, Boot Polish, Raj Kapoor's movie, was uh, inspired by the Sicha's Shushine. Uh, Vittoria the Sita's most uh, famous film, of course, is uh, Bicycle Thieves, which is uh, generally regarded as the film that heralded Italian neorealism. Uh, the plot is that uh, an employed man, played by Lambato Magurani, is forced to steal a bike and is caught by a crowd. Now, what makes the situation pathetic is the fact that the man's own bicycle which is extremely crucial to his job of bill posting is stolen. So, that is a commentary, that is a social commentary on a, uh, 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 on a Italian society of that period, that uh, a man is prevented from earning an honest living. Okay. All that he needs is a bicycle. And you can think of uh, the Iranian movie, Children of Heaven, where uh, what what do the children desire? Just a pair of shoes. So, in a society where there is so much of disparity between the haves and have nots, uh, this is where crimes would originate. That is what that is what the thesis is all about. So, the film is characteristic of the Italian neorealism with its use of non professional actors and shooting on actual Roman locations. And uh, famously, it has influenced Satyajit Ray's Pather Panchali and uh, Iran's Children of Heaven, which was made in 1999. Uh, let us talk about from the neorealists, we will move on to the Italian masters. And Federico Fellini is one of the most prominent names of this uh, generation. So, Federico Fellini, 1920 to 93. He was the son of a commercial traveler, and as a child, he once ran away from home to join the circus. Back in Rome, he started his career as a cartoonist and illustrator. Fellini's early work reflects a preoccupation with human weakness for illusion and loneliness. In La Strada, that is, The Road, in 1954, 
The film which uh, won him international recognition, Fellini unfolds a tale of traveling circus, which was a recurring milieu in his works. Circus as a motif has been frequently employed by several great directors, uh, Max Ophelsis, Lola Mantes, Raj Kapoor's Mera Naam Joker. So, circus as a, a metaphor, uh, you know all the world is a stage. So, circus as a metaphor for uh, for our world is uh, has often been employed by filmmakers. Uh, Fellini's most popular film remains La Dolce Vita, which is an eloquent statement on life's excesses and the role of paparazzi. This is the movie that coined the word paparazzi in the modern times. It uh, featured Marcello Mastroianni and Anouk Ami and Anita Ekberg. It is a portrait of the decadent lifestyles of the rich and famous uh, in Italy. The plot in uh, La Dolce Vita uh, centers on the exploits of a gossip journalist played by Mastroianni, who covers the beat of swinging rooms party scene. Along uh, with his companion uh, played by uh, Anukami, Marcello travels in the exclusive set of the rich uh, and the famous and also the rich and the bold, okay, even as he looks for some meaning in his life. This is a very existentialist theme, people trying to look for meanings in their lives, uh, on, battling ennui, boredom and th that is the lives of the rich and famous is all about according to the Dolce Vita. Uh, Fellini's another landmark movie is Eight and Half, which was released in 1963 and it is a semi autobiographical account of an artist's creative process. The film traces a film director Guido Ansellini's or perhaps Fellini's uh, since it is uh, partially based on his own life, creative and personal life. So, with uh, uh, the plot goes as that there is a new project the director is uh, uh, about to start and there is no script. So, the filmmaker has come to a dead end cul de sac and Guido plums his memories of childhood and his hidden desires for inspirations. One of the famous lines in eight and half goes as I have nothing to say, but I want to say it. Okay. Again battling creative block, writer's block or rather director's block, mm, uh, battling on we and how to get over, how to find meaning in life, that is the theme. Originally, it was titled A Beautiful Confusion and Fellini takes us through a kaleidoscope of vivid and often outlandish images, hoping for his artistic birth. So, watch uh, eight and half for the way he uh, juxtaposes very uh, dreamlike sequences with uh, very real sequences. Okay, so, that is what the imagery is what is important in Fellini. Most of his films are autobiographical and they are all influenced by his life, his dreams, his passions, his own films and his love for performative art. So, plenty of intertextuality, a terribly, terribly important filmmaker and very entertaining as well. Um, Michelangelo Antonini, now this is another important filmmaker, an, an Italian master, 1912 to 2007. He began his professional life as a critic and was fired by Mussolini's regime for his leftist views. Before turning into an independent director, he contributed to the screenplay of Rosalini's A Pilot Returns in 1942. His early films uh, such as the 1950 Chronicle of a Love Affair, influenced by Visconti's Obsession and the City, showed the influence of neorealism and established his aesthetics of alienation. La Ventura, of course, remains his most important film, but uh, uh, Blow Up is also pretty well known. Uh, it's, it was made in English and another landmark movie a movie that went on to influence a host of new wave directors across Europe and 
in Hollywood. Um, let me read you, and this is a book um, I often refer to Roger Ebert's The Great Movies. Hmm? And uh, this is the first volume in which he reviews Blow Up. He says, Michelangelo's Antonini's Blow Up opened in America two months before I became a film critic and colored my first years on the job with its lingering influence. It was a wake up call for what Stanley Kaufman named the film generation, which quickly lined up outside Bonnie and Clyde, Weekend, Battle of Algiers, Easy Rider and Five Easy Pieces. So, you see along with all these Hollywood films blow up a British film, but directed by Antonini, it became one of the key films of the new wave cinema, the counter culture movement. It was the highest grossing art film to date, was picked as the best film of 1966 by the National Society of Film Critics and got Oscar nominations for screenplay and direction. Young audiences aren't interested anymore in a movie about a trendy London photographer who may or may not have witnessed a murder, who lives a life of cynicism and ennui. This is an important concept in cinema of Antoinini, ennui. Hmm? That, that's what La Ventura is all about. And who ends up in a park at dawn watching college kids play tennis with an imaginary ball. The children of the audiences that bought tickets for blow up prefer ironic self referential slasher movies. Americans flew to swinging London in the 1960s. Today's Londoners pile onto chartered jets to Orlando. And that is how Roger Ebert introduces us to his introduction to Blow Up, which he feels uh, was a, a movie, uh, a path breaking movie in several ways. And uh, he continues, over three days at the University of Virginia, I revisited Blow Up in a shot by shot analysis. F freed from the hype and fashion, it emerges as a great film, if not the one we thought we were seeing at the time. This was at the 98 Virginia Festival of American Film, which had cool as its theme. The festival began with the emergence of the beat generation and advanced through Cassavetes to blow up, after which the virus of cool leaped from its nurturing subculture into millions of willing new hosts and colored our society ever since, right down to and manifestly including South Park. Watching blow up once again, I took a few minutes to acclimate myself to the loopy psychedelic colors and the tendency of the hero to use words like fab. Then I found the spell of the movie settling around me. Antonini uses the materials of a suspense thriller without the payoff. He places them within a London of heartless fashion photography, bold rock audiences, languid pot parties and a hero whose dead soul is roused briefly by a challenge to his craftsmanship. So, that is what blow up is all about. People are often asked what is blow up and uh, what is it about? and uh, no one really has the answer and that is a characteristic quality of Antonini. Next we will talk about Pier Paolo Pasolini 1922 to 75. Widely respected as a poet, novelist and director, Pasolini is one of the most controversial and ambitious of filmmakers. His writings were scandalous and iconoclastic and celebrated the low lives of the Italian society. 
that the low lies included pimps, prostitutes, hustlers, gamblers, thieves. And uh, we are told that uh, Pasolini often consorted with these people. One was his own uh, socialist tendencies, no one was in Pradig, okay, no one was beneath him. So, he would not hang around with them. He also uh, drew much of his creative inspiration from these people. Okay, it is often said that uh, a writer should never lose track or lose touch with reality, with the ground reality of the society he lives in. And Basoloni is a su supreme example of that kind of a filmmaker, the, the kind of author who never lost touch with the harsh realities of life. Uh, one of his most uh, well known and successful films includes the gospel according to Matthew 1964, which was filmed in the district of Basilica. It was shot in a totally new realistic style without a screenplay. So, much of uh, the shooting was improvised. Christ was a non-professional Spanish student of economics and Mary at the time of crucifixion is Pasolini's own mother. The director uses simple cameras and minimal sets. So, it is a very minimalistic kind of movie almost along the lines of a Dreher movie, where actors are extremely uh, real and locations and sets. So, it is not the MGM uh, Cecil the Mill kind of a uh, uh, biblical movie. It is a very uh, gritty, very realistic kind of a setting. And uh, interestingly, music ranges, because pa Pasolini was extremely interested in experimenting with music also. So, music ranges between masses by Bach and Mozart and also the blues. So, it is a, it's a combination, it is a collision of all kinds of mu music. Pasolini's Jesus is more along the lines of a messiah for the countercultural times and an angry young man. He is less of the religious figure and more uh, uh, a harbinger of the countercultural times. Okay, so, you can look at the, you can consider the references, the intertextualities at play here. Much of the dialogues in the film are in a debating style, where a question is answered with a question or a parable. The director's anti-capitalistic views are clearly felt, as Jesus often rebukes the rich and the powerful and condemns the materialistic society. So, often he is portrayed as Pasolini's own mouthpiece. Next director, Bernardo Bertolucci, 1940, he was born in and um, still making films. So, Bertolucci started his career as uh, uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini's assistant, a movie uh, called uh, Akathon and later based his film Le Commons Cessa on a script by Pasolini. He gained recognition from before the revolution, which concerns a young man's inability to break away from his bourgeois values and fully commits himself to Marxist ideals. Uh, he is unable to actually fully commit himself to Marxist ideals. The Conformist is based on a novel by Alberto Moravia and it explores the psychology of a young man, who is hired by Italian Pesces to assassinate his former professor in France. The film is an amazing study of tussle between authority and rebellion. We have been talking about the conformist when we talked about uh, Coppola's The Godfather. Okay, so, watch the conformist and watch The Godfather and perhaps uh, you will find why Coppola regards Bertolucci so highly. Uh, Bertolucci's other famous works include Last Tango in Paris with Brando in 1972, The Last Emperor 1987, The Shattering Sky. The Little Buddha and The Dreamers, which was released in 2004. Some other great works uh, from Italy are Il Postino, Cinema Paradiso, which has been regarded as one of the most popular films from Italy uh, during uh, 
uh, recent times. It is directed by Giuseppe Tonitoro, 1988, and uh, thus our interest in Italian cinema continues. Thank you.